Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's me, totally not ripping off Tiger King. Now, if you're one of the few people that hasn't yet seen Tiger King, what I just did won't make any sense to you. And you'll just think I'm weird, which honestly isn't anything new. But here I am, your favorite math teacher, Mr. O, back with some more math. You guessed it. Uh, now, I promised I wouldn't do this one day in advance like I did last week. I'm doing this a day and a half in advance, so I'm getting better. Um, but hey, there's a lot of cool math coming up this week. Um, we're actually starting the calculus unit, what would have been the calculus unit if we were in school. Um, unfortunately, we're not. I don't know if you've heard, but we're not in school right now. Um, so we are actually going to dive into the basics of limits today which we've been talking about kind of intermittently throughout. I've mentioned it a few times. I've maybe written the notation a few times. Um, but today, we're actually going to go ahead and discuss what limits are for the first time concretely. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in here. Now, we can look at limits kind of several different ways, and then eventually we use them in calculus to build a more rigorous definition of what calculus is. And so you can think of calculus as having three main branches. We first start by talking about limit calculus, and then we talk about differential calculus, and then integral calculus. And then if you're taking BC next year, we get into infinite series as kind of that fourth area. But when we're first learning calculus, that's kind of the three main areas. So limits is where we start. It begins our understanding of what calculus is. At its core, calculus is the way we interpret how the world changes and interacts as time progresses, right? It studies the rates of change of things over time. Um, and so kind of one of the things at the core of that, if we're building all these skills, is a limit. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Mean Girls, you'll remember at one pivotal moment at the end of the film, Lindsay Lohan's character shouts during a math competition, the limit does not exist. And today, we will indeed determine that some of these limits might not exist. Great stuff, Cotton. Okay, here we go. So, 12.1 in the textbook, we start by estimating limits graphically. Now, we eventually move on to kind of solving these purely algebraically, but when we start learning about them, we learn how to do it graphically. Uh, so, the limit of a function, here's the definition. Let F be a function, let A and capital L be real numbers. Capital L is the limit of f of x as x approaches a written as follows the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l and that's true if the following conditions are met so kind of the way i read that you need all of these pieces every time x represents the variable that your function is with respect to okay so as x values approach a for f of x we approach some y value L, and L is a y value. Okay. Okay, so that is true if the following two conditions are met. And if that made no sense to you, which it might, um, I'll show you what it means graphically in just a second. So, first uh, item here. What this means is, as x takes values closer and closer to A on both sides of A, so approaching from the left and right, okay, the corresponding values approach values of f of x that get closer and closer to L. So as x gets closer and closer to A, closing in on both sides, the y values get closer and closer to L, okay? And we need to see that from both sides, okay? And more importantly, we have to approach the same value from both sides, approach the same value from both sides, okay? Okay, so that's the first thing. That's the first condition that has to be met. And then the second condition, the value of f of x can be made as close to L as desired by taking values of x close to A, okay? Now, what that means is this. If for this limit to exist, we only have to be able to get as close as we want to. In higher level mathematics, we call that getting arbitrarily close to A. 
Okay. What so this the super important kind of conclusion to make there. Nowhere in there does it say f of x has to be defined at a. You only have to be able to approach it from both sides. Now that's super important because that allows us to find the limits of holes on a graph. Okay, f of x does not have to be defined at the value we are approaching. At the value we are approaching. I just went all Salcon on you. Okay, and that's the a value right there. Okay. So f of a does not have to be equal to L in order for the limit to exist. In terms of continuity, that matters, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean a couple weeks. But you just have to approach the same value from both sides. Let's get into this visually. So find the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus 2x plus 3. Okay, so here's our graph of f. All right, so here, if I get up there, here is f of 1, okay, right about there. And so what this limit means is, okay, as x gets close to 1 from the left and from the right, what are we approaching? The answer to that question is the answer to this limit. Okay, we could even zoom in if you want to. Okay, here's the zoom in. All right, so here's x equals 1 right here. Okay, and x is equal to 6. It's right about there. Okay, so again, as we approach from the left and right, as x approaches 1 from both sides, what does the function approach? it approaches a y value of 6. And that's the answer to the limit. Okay, As we approach x, what are we approaching for y? Okay, As we close in from the left and right, what is the y value approaching? It's approaching 6. And notice it's the same thing from both sides. If it was different, then the limit wouldn't exist. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, So we can also look at this with a, with a table, tabularly. So x is still approaching 1, right? The limit as x approaches 1 of x squared plus 2x plus 3. Here, we're approaching from the left, right? 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999 for x, right? It's getting super close to 1, but not touching. We call that getting arbitrarily close. And then here, we're approaching from the right, right? 1.1, 1 1.01, 1.001. We're getting arbitrarily close from both sides. And if we look at these y values, we can make a determination about what we're approaching, and it looks like we're approaching 6, and in fact we are. Okay, So the answer to that limit is 6. Now, um, a couple things notation-wise. You need to write the limit notation every single time until you actually get an answer of 6. Okay, And there's certain things that you have to write every time, too. You're going to want to be lazy. It's going to be tempting to be lazy and to skimp on the notation. But in calculus, moving forward, kind of in higher level mathematics, even though it doesn't seem important, the details are almost more important than the answer. What I mean by that is, if you were to write a sentence in English class, right, and not put commas, and not put apostrophes, and not put a period at the end of it, and not capitalize the first letter, right, you would get points off for that in English class, right? That, that's equivalent to not properly notating your math in higher level mathematics, right? When you write a limit, you also need the x approaches 1 every time, and you have to write what the function is every single time, okay? If you don't put those things, it's considered incomplete, right? You're not fully communicating what's going on, just as a sentence wouldn't be properly communicated without proper punctuation and grammar, right? It's all the same thing. Okay, so there's kind of a basic example. Let's start looking at some more things. So here's a piecewise function. We're going to find the limit as x approaches 4. Now you'll notice that 4 is actually where this piecewise function is broken up. And so this is kind of where the interesting stuff starts to happen. So I think the first thing we need to do is graph both pieces. And we can do that in two separate colors. So we'll graph 2x plus 1 uh, for x greater than or equal to 4. So if we plug in 4, uh, it looks like we get 9. 
So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There we go. And it's got a slope of two. So up two to the right one. And we have that piece right there. And then in blue, we'll write the second uh, function here. It's another line. We can plug in four for X. We're gonna get 12 minus three, which is also nine. So uh, those dots are gonna overlap. Actually, that blue one would be an open circle, but they overlap. Um, and then it has a slope of negative three here. So one, two, three to the left one. One, two, three, left one. One, two, three, left one. And that's good enough, okay? So there's our function. What we need to do is we need to see what we're approaching from the left and right. From the left, we approach nine. And from the right, we approach nine. So the answer to this limit is nine. Okay. There you go. Okay. The table also uh, supports our work there. As we approach four from the left, we get super close to nine. And as we approach from the right, we get super close to nine. So the answer to that limit is nine. Okay. Cool. Here's another one. Um, now, interesting, um, little kind of caveat about this example. Here we have a rational function, right? We're finding the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x squared plus 3x plus 2 over x plus 1. Something you're going to want to get used to here is simplifying these things um, whenever possible. So let's go ahead and do that. The limit as x approaches negative 1, notice I'm writing that limit. Let's go ahead and factor the numerator. That's going to factor into x plus 1 x plus 2 all over x plus 1. Okay, let's go ahead and cancel those and uh, we're left with the limit as x approaches negative 1 and all we have left there is x plus 2. Okay, so let's figure out what this is. Now we've simplified this all the way down to just a line and in fact if you were to put this original problem in your graphing calculator in y equals without the limit part. It would just graph the line. But there's a hole in it. There's a hole at x equals negative 1. That would be a problem if you were trying to evaluate the function there. But here it's not an issue. Remember the definition of a limit is that we just have to be able to get as close to that x value as we want to. But we never actually have to be equal to it. Right? We aren't really concerned if the function is defined at x. We just want to make a determination about what it's approaching as we get super close to that x value. So we have a hole here at negative 1 on the graph. And we can see this even better if we zoom in. There's the hole. And it looks like, so there's x equals negative 1, looks like we're approaching a y value of 1. Okay, From the left, we approach 1. And from the right, we approach 1. And even though the function is not defined there, right? we don't have a value at f of negative 1, we can still evaluate the limit because all we care about is what does it look like we're approaching, and it looks like we're approaching positive 1. All right, okay. So go ahead and take a look here. Um, this first example, before simplifying, if you were to plug in negative 1 into this function right away, right? You might be noticing that the answer to these limit problems is just whatever you get when you plug in that x value. And you wouldn't be wrong completely in saying that. But the problem with that as a strategy is that sometimes you'll get something that's not an answer, even though there secretly is one underneath it all. What I mean by that is this. If you plug negative 1 into this rational function here, you get 0 over 0. And that's what we call an indeterminate form. Okay. And this is never an answer. Okay. We're going to talk much more about these later on in whatever calculus you take next year. But an indeterminate form essentially tells you that there's more algebra to be done to figure out what the answer is. 0 over 0 is not an answer. It's also not a non-answer, right? It's just, it's an indeterminate form. We can't determine anything about it until we do more work. And you'll notice that, right, we were able to go on and do some work. We factored the top, we canceled out, 
we got a hole, we removed the problem, and we were able to figure out the value of the limit. Okay. There's another popular indeterminate form that we often use in calculus, and it's infinity over infinity. And we'll look at that one much closer as well. Okay. So there you go. We can also look at this on a table, and it confirms our suspicions as well. We're approaching one from both sides. So the answer to this limit is one. Fantastic. Cool. So, you know, you might be asking yourself the question that I just said before, right? Cool, but can't I just evaluate f of x at x? And for the most part, you actually can, right? For the most part, you can. Unless you get an indeterminate form. You always want to try this first. Because if you get a number, that's actually just going to be your answer every single time. So always try this first. And if you get an indeterminate form, then you need to do some more algebra. So here, for example, we're taking the limit as x approaches 3 of x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 4 over 3x plus 4. If we plug 3 in, we get 27 plus 18 minus 15 minus 4 all over, that's going to be 9 plus 4, which is 13. So the numerator comes out to 26 over 13. So the answer to this limit should be 2. And if we follow our graphical analysis strategy that we've been looking at, we'll see that we actually get that same result. Let's investigate. So we're approaching as x gets goes uh, as x approaches 3. Okay, so right about there. So if we zoom in a little bit, here's x equals 3. Looks like we are, in fact, approaching 2 from both sides. Okay. So there you go, right? For the most part, you should always try plugging in the limit value first. If you get a number, that's your answer. However, that often won't be the case. And in fact, it's significantly more interesting when it's not the case. And there's more algebra to be done. Something else to look at here. Um, we have a vertical asymptote on this graph, and it's at x equals negative 4 thirds. And so somewhere is right about there. Ah, that was poorly done. Let's try that again. Let's try to squeeze that in a little bit better. Right about there. OK, there's our vertical asymptote. So let's let's throw another problem on here, right? Let's think about this. The limit as x approaches negative 4 thirds of f of x is equal to. So let's try to think about this one. As we approach negative 4 thirds from the left, this approaches negative infinity, right? The y values get super, super small in the negative direction. But as we approach from the right, we go off to positive infinity. We're going to take a closer look at examples like this in a little bit. But since one side is approaching negative infinity and the other is approaching infinity, this limit does not exist. And I promise you we'll take a closer look at that in a little bit. Okay? Here's a table that I generated using my graphing calculator. You can you know, recognize that formatting anywhere. That's a TI-84 if I've ever seen one. Um, and you can see from both sides that we are, in fact, approaching 2 for the example I had there in the first place. Okay? But like I said before, simply evaluating at x every single time by plugging it in often runs into problems. And here's another example of that. If we plug in 2 here, we're taking the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. If we plug in 2, we're going to get 4 minus 4 over 2 minus 2, which gets us 0 over 0. And that's not an answer. And so some more algebra needs to be done. Next virtual class is going to focus on all the algebraic techniques. For right now, we're really just looking at this graphically with a little bit of algebra. So the top is going to be a difference of squares, right? That's x plus 2, x minus 2, all over x minus 2. And so you can cancel out those x minus 2s, and we're left with the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2. And so now we can turn to the graph for this, right? So here's x equals 2. If we follow it up, we get a y value of 4. And if we were to plug 2 in this, we also get 4. 
Okay. So the answer to that limit is four. Getting the hang of this now, right? Play it back if you're not, right? That's the beauty of this being on video. Um, limits at the beginning are a pretty easy thing to understand, right? We're approaching from both sides. You can't see what I'm doing right now with my fingers, but I'm approaching both sides of this podcasting microphone with my two fingers from the left and right. And the limit would be kind of the top of the podcasting microphone. How many times can I say podcasting microphone? I think also I should do like an NPR news type show. I feel like my voice is well suited for that. This is all math considered. I'm Jay O'Rourke. Today's top stories. Limits. What are they? Okay, so speaking of that, will there always be a limit? And uh, here I'll direct you back to Mean Girls. Now, if you've never seen it, go ahead and watch it. It's required watching. Um, stars Lindsay Lohan. Before she went all nutso. Uh, fun fact, there's actually not two of her, like I thought for many years when she was on Parent Trap. Okay, we're taking the limit as x approaches 3. We have two separate functions here. I think it's necessary to graph them both. So 2x minus 4 is going to be in blue, and 4x plus 1 will be in red. And then we'll figure out this whole limit thing. So let's plug in 3 into this. So that's going to be 2. So x equals 3, up 2, and a solid dot there. And then the blue line is defined for x less than or equal to 3. So we'll go to the left here, down 2 to the left one, down 2 to the left one, down 2 to the left one. There's that piece. Okay. So here we're at 2. So in red now, let's graph the other piece. If we plug 3 into the red function, we're going to get 13, which is way up here. Open dot there. And then it kind of goes off that way, right? Give or take. So now for the fun part. This limit doesn't actually exist. From the left, we're approaching 2. But from the right, we're approaching 13. And that's a problem. Okay. The limit won't always exist. Okay. This limit does not. Okay. And like I said before, from the left, we're approaching two and from the right, we're approaching 13 and therefore the limit does not exist. Okay. Now, the AP test, and this is way too early to be talking about the AP test. My kids just took theirs. But I'm going to talk about it anyway. So the AP test, you're actually not allowed to abbreviate this as DNE. You actually have to write the whole thing out in words, which I think is super annoying. I don't really care which one you do, but for the AP exam next year, you actually have to write out does not exist for a reason that escapes me. I don't know why. Someone at the college board just decided that they wanted to see that. And so now it's a thing, okay? So there you go. You actually have to approach the same thing from the left and right in order for your limit to exist. Let's take a look at another one. We're taking the limit as x approaches 1 here of 1 over x minus 1 cubed. Now there's a vertical asymptote here. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, okay? And so if we take a look at this graphically, we can see what's going on. So here's our vertical asymptote at 1. And it's even better if we zoom in. Okay. So using the same logic from the last problem, right? In order for our limit to exist, we have to approach the same value from the left and right. But there's pretty much always going to be a problem when you're approaching a value where you know there's a vertical asymptote. When I approach that vertical asymptote from the left, I'm approaching negative infinity for the y values. But as we approach x from the right, I'm getting infinity for my y values. And since one side goes off to negative infinity and the other side goes off to infinity, this limit does not exist. In fact, if you go back to our definition of a limit that we wrote way at the beginning of these notes, the limit has to approach a real number. A has to be a real number and capital L has to be a real number, which means our limit has to be a real number. Infinity is not a real number. Infinity is an idea. Man, that's something I should get tattooed on my body. Infinity is an idea. 
its purpose is to help us explain that which is hard to explain, right? It represents the idea that numbers are boundless in terms of their size. That's a very cosmic result, okay? So in terms of something we can actually write down here, the limit cannot be equal to infinity or negative infinity, okay? That results in something that doesn't exist, okay? And we'll take a look at that a little bit closer in just a second. Okay, here's another example where a limit fails to exist. This is an example of a function that oscillates back and forth, okay? The limit as x approaches zero of cosine of one over x. Now in your graphing calculators, if you were to type in cosine of one over x in radian mode into y equals, you get something that looks pretty cool like this. Now it is definitely pretty cool. Now the thing that's going on here is it's oscillating infinitely between negative one and one. So as we approach zero, it just keeps skipping down and up, okay? This oscillates infinitely between negative one and one. And so the limit does not exist because we never actually land on a finite limit value L. And also we don't keep getting closer and closer and closer. Here's a table to kind of help us figure out what's going on. Notice that as we approach zero from the left, oops, that's from the right. This table's all messed up anyway. Notice the values are the same on the left and right, but they keep oscillating negative, positive, and then positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, right? There's no rhyme or reason. I think that's how you spell rhyme. Okay, there's no rhyme or reason. And so we, since we can't determine what's going on, the limit just doesn't exist. Okay, let's tie that all together. So conditions under which the limit fails to exist. The first example we did was an example of f of x approaching two different values from the left and right. Okay, the limit from the left was not same as the limit from the right. And therefore the limit didn't exist. Example two was an example of f of x becoming infinitely large in magnitude as x approaches from either side aka infinity or negative infinity. That's also a scenario where the limit fails to exist. And then finally, example three was an example of an oscillating function. f of x oscillates infinitely between two fixed values as x approaches a. All three of those result in a limit that doesn't exist. By far, one and two are the most common. You hardly are ever going to see three, but it is something that you need to be aware of. Okay, great. We've got the basics of limits down. Let's get into some one-sided limits. So that idea of having to approach the same thing from the left and right is extremely important to building a concrete definition of limits, and that's what we're gonna build here. So one-sided limits and limits involving infinity. <clears throat> Let's first take a look at a right-hand limit. A right-hand limit is a limit individually written expressing the limit strictly from the right hand side. In other words, the limit as x approaches from the right. The way we notate this is with a plus sign next to the a value. So we read this as the limit as x approaches a from the right. Okay, And that specifically is asking us, okay, what's the value from the right hand side? Okay, And now we also have that's our right-handed notation. We also have left-handed notation. This is specifically showing when x approaches from the left, and we put a little minus sign next to the a. So the limit is x approaches a from the left. This allows us to individually express these two things, and often you're going to need to do that. Okay. So this is just a rigorous notation to individually express limits from the left and right. Let's go ahead and look at an example. Now, most of the time, this becomes a necessity when working with a piecewise function like we are here. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so 2x plus 5 when x is less than 3. So if we plug in 3, we get 6 plus 5, which is 11. So 1, 2, 3, and then 11's off the grid. Off-road mathing. And uh, that's for x less than 3. So down 2 to the left 1, down 2 to the left 1, down 2 to the left 1. yippee ki -yay. There we are. 
So let's graph the other piece. Let's see what happens. If I plug 3 into this, I get 9 minus 7, which is 2. And then slope of 3. So up 3 to the right 1, up 3 to the right 1. Whoosh, there we go. Okay. This y value, as we approach from the right, is 2. And this y value, as we approach from the left, is 11. Okay, so here's how we can write that. It says find the limit as x approaches 3 from the left and the limit as x approaches 3 from the right. The limit as x approaches 3 from the right is 2. Okay, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left is 11. Therefore, since the left and right hand limits aren't equal, the overall limit does not exist. Okay. Now, sometimes your left and right hand limits might also not exist. That's okay. In this case, they both existed, but since they weren't the same thing, the overall limit at three does not exist. Okay. Let's take a look at another one here. We've got 4x minus 1 for x less than 2. Whoops, I didn't want to use green there. I suppose it doesn't really matter, but. And then we have 2x plus 3 for x greater than or equal to 2. Let's go ahead and graph these things. So for x less than 2, so plug 2 into there, we get 8 minus 1 is 7. So 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and open circle there. Okay. And now we're down 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 to the left. Man, is there anything more fun than counting slopes on lines? Man, I could do that all day. Remember when life was simple and you, your biggest worry in life was the upcoming slope quiz in algebra class? Man. I yearn for those times. Let's plug in 2. So 4 plus 3 is 7. Hey, good news. They overlap. Cool. Um, that often means that our limit will exist. Okay, so let's see what happens. Find the limit from the left and right as we approach 2. No problem, coach. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left is 7. And the limit as x approaches 2 from the right is also 7. So therefore, the limit as x approaches 2 overall is equal to 7. And so, since we now have the ability to individually express limits from the left and right, here's how we can concretely write the definition of a limit. If both the left and right hand limits exist at A and are equal, so they both have to exist and be equal, it's the limit of the function at A. Therefore, we can write the following. The limit as x approaches A of f of x is equal to L if and only if, it's a biconditional, IFF, which means it reads the same forward and backwards. The limit as x approaches a from the left is equal to L, and the limit as x approaches a from the right is L. Okay, there we go. Okie dokes, and we'll finish here by taking a look at limits increasing towards infinity. Okay, so these limits here, x is going to approach a finite value, but the answer to these limits ends up being infinity. These are going to represent vertical asymptotes. And in fact, this is going to replace our definition for what a vertical asymptote actually is. And later on, we'll replace our definition for a horizontal asymptote. Okay. So four ways that we can represent this. The limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x equals infinity or negative infinity, or the limit as x approaches a from the left is infinity or negative infinity. Okay. For all four of these scenarios, the limit does not exist, okay? So for all four of these, they technically don't exist, right? Because they're not approaching a finite value. However, we're expressing the way the limit does not exist. This is where we get a little bit confused, but really we're trying to be as specific as we can. Instead of writing the limit doesn't exist here, you're going to write equals infinity. And really, we shouldn't be writing equals infinity because you can never actually be equal to infinity. We should be writing yields infinity with arrows. Okay. So all four of these don't exist, but we're being specific as to how they don't exist. Sometimes we can't be more specific and all we can say is it doesn't exist. 
But if you have the opportunity to be more specific, be more specific. Okay, It's understood that if the answer is infinity or negative infinity, we all understand we don't exist. It's kind of like if you fail a test, right? Well, okay, if you fail a test and you go home and tell your parents, they're going to ask you, well, why did you fail the test? And they're going to want you to be more specific as to why that happened, right? And you could say, well, I didn't study, or I cheated and got caught, or I forgot we had a test that day, right? Or I just didn't know what I was doing. You didn't fail the test, right? But you're being more specific as to why. And that's what's going on here. Well, I don't exist. Well, why? Well, I approached infinity. Okay, cool. Now I have more info. All right. Let's uh, try some examples and maybe it'll make more sense. Here we have the graph of a really common parent function, 1 over x, which has a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 and a horizontal asymptote at, uh, sorry, at x equals 0 and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. The limit as x approaches 0 from the right is infinity, but it doesn't exist, right? We're not writing it doesn't exist, we're writing infinity, but it's understood to not exist. The limit as x approaches 0 from the left is negative infinity. Still doesn't exist, but we're being specific as to why. Be as specific as you can. Okay. So then, when we write the overall limit as we approach zero, the most specific we can be is does not exist. Right? From the right we approach infinity, and from the left we approach negative infinity. And so the most specific we can be is does not exist. Now, say for example, I had another function that looks like this. Right? And I had an asymptote at 1. Here, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x approaches infinity, and the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x also approaches infinity. So the overall limit as x approaches 1 of f of x approaches infinity. We actually can be more specific there, but it still doesn't exist. But you don't have to write that. It's just understood to exist. So here, the left and right hand sides matched. And so when we said the overall limit, we could be more specific and say infinity. But here, in blue, they didn't match. And so the most specific we can be is does not exist. Let's take a look at one more example here. This one has a trig function involved. It's cotangent. And we have asymptotes at infinite many places. We have one at 0. We have another one at pi. We have another one at negative pi. Okay. All good times. So let's answer some questions here. Okay, the limit as x approaches pi from the right. Okay, so pi from the right. Approaching pi from the right goes to infinity. Okay. And approaching pi from the left whoosh, goes to negative infinity. So the overall limit doesn't exist. Okay. How about the limit as x approaches pi over 2 from the right? Well, pi over 2 is right there. So as we approach pi over 2 from the right, it's 0. As we approach from the left, it's 0. And so the overall limit is equal to 0. Those ones actually did exist. In fact, all the limits exist everywhere in this function except for places where there's asymptotes. Then they don't. You can find the limit anywhere else you want to. Okay, last page here. I'm going to try and keep this video under 45 minutes. That's our new definition for what a vertical asymptote is, right? Um, if there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, then the limit as x approaches 1 um, either goes to infinity, negative infinity, or doesn't exist. These are new definitions for horizontal asymptotes, limits as x approaches positive or negative infinity. And this is for functions with horizontal asymptotes. So, two scenarios here. Either the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to L, or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is equal to L. For either of those scenarios, y equals L is the horizontal asymptote. Essentially what this is saying is, as you really go far to the right, 
and far to the left, what are we approaching? And if you think about how a horizontal asymptote looks, right, especially for kind of our famous parent function here, whoops, famous parent function one over X, right? Looks like this horizontal asymptote at zero. As we go really far out towards infinity, right? We're approaching zero. And as we go really far out to negative infinity, we're approaching zero. And that's where our horizontal asymptote is, right? Y equals zero. Let's take a look at an example. We have f of x equals 2x plus 3 over x minus 2. Now, from our algebraic knowledge, we know that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And there's a horizontal asymptote. Well, the degree of the top and bottom is the same, so it's the ratio of the leading coefficients. So y equals 2. So before we even begin, by our definition above, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, that's just asking you, what's the horizontal asymptote? It's 2 here, so the answer to both of these is 2. The limit as we approach infinity and negative infinity is equal to 2. If we were to actually graph that on here, okay, we can see from the left, and as we approach positive infinity, for both of those, we're approaching 2. Okay, These are just horizontal asymptote questions. Okay, Let's try one more. Here we have 3 over x minus 2 quantity squared. So there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, right? Degree of the bottom is bigger than the top. So if we take a look at this graphically, here's what it looks like. Here is our vertical asymptote. And here is our horizontal. Okay. So the limit as x approaches infinity. So we go really far out to the right. This is just going to be our horizontal asymptote. So the answer is 0. Same as if we approach negative infinity with x, y tends towards 0. 2 from the right goes to infinity. 2 from the left also goes to infinity. And so the overall limit also goes to infinity. All three of these don't exist, but we're being more specific if we can. Okay, there you go. There's uh, estimating limits graphically. In the next video, we'll take a look at algebraic methods to solve for limits. Uh, in the meantime, let me go ahead and put the old John Hancock of these notes. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. We're starting to get into some really cool cosmic stuff. Um, hope I have some of you again next year in my BC class. And who knows, maybe I'll also be teaching AB. Um, so that'll be a really good time. So hope you enjoyed the video. Um, limits are super cool. Look forward to discussing them with you for the first time in class on Thursday. Peace out. Enjoy. Enjoy everything. Enjoy quarantine. I hope you're doing well. Okay, peace out, Cub Scout. Goodbye.